permit me to ask a first question. Um, I'm always wondering when you show, show statistics, uh, you showed us that we are more um, happy than we ever were, but we're also still afraid. Yeah. Is it the same people who are happy as the ones that are afraid? Or is there a correlation? Or are they different people? And are you able to find which pockets of unease yeah. are wrong? It's a very interesting question. The, the, the point is that the, 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 the satisfaction with the with, with personal uh, with personal life and also happiness in personal life is so um, um, so biased in one direction that it's hardly possible to make that kind of distinction. So the same people who say I'm happy in my personal life are afraid of what could what could happen to them or are afraid of what happens happening outside. And the fact you see you see this even in the incidents we have had after the murder of Theo van Gogh. The interesting thing is that the riots and the problems there were were not in Amsterdam, were not in The Hague, were not in Rotterdam, were in small cities and certainly out in the country. Inside. People who didn't have access to the, 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 the programs that van Gogh made or access to his columns. But there you saw that the, 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 the general fear a feel of a feeling of aggression was much much probably more prevalent in the cities where people had daily contact with each other. So I think it was, it was realized that these things in uh, my sense was not very rational, but had a feeling of uh, I'm in a good situation, I have I have a lot to lose because that also has to do with satisfaction and happiness. And the other thing is I'm afraid what could happen, these things just can't go together. It's not uh, contradictory. Okay, then I'll walk over for the next question. Yes, I was wondering, um, there's something I've been noticing as well. You say um, we go from high trust to low trust when it comes to our government. Yeah, we trust the government less. But at the same time, we seem to want to move from freedom to security. Yeah. And we entrust the same government with that security. So yeah. how does that work? Interesting, yeah, very good question. Very interesting point. These are these typical, typical things where you think this is contradictory and at the same time you see that this is um, that this is for people just uh, is a normal thing. And what's, what's at stake there, what's, what's at issue there, um, that you see that we are even, let's say, it's a bit um, a sad situation, let us say so. In countries like the Netherlands, look like Denmark or Switzerland, people have very high expectations of what the government can and should do. If you, if you are living in Morocco, you do not expect anything from the government. Yeah, what you expect is trouble, and is corruption, and is violence. You do not trust your government because you do know they will do nothing for you. And you are, you know, worse in that sense. In, in, in more Western countries, you see that people have high hopes. And unavoidably, they get dis disappointed. Because their hopes are much too high for what the government can achieve for them, what the government can do for them. And especially in individualized countries, people expect that the government is doing it for them, individually, personally. And the government cannot do that. The government makes an arrangement for everybody in the same situation. And that's what people do not want. I always say this is the difference between that you could say um, in the welfare state, the government is behaving like, you could say, benevolent father. Um, it does not make a difference between the children. If they are in the same situation, they have the same rights, etc. And people long for the mother who says, well, you are my favorite child. That's what people want. I, I make it very simple in this way. But this is, this is what's happening. This is one of the things that happens in society. The dynamics of, the, 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 you could say, in effect, governments who are very, in one way, even if you look at it from the from historical point of view, or also compared to other countries, are very competent to do many things in society, to provide society with many, many things. Um, and the, the expectations of people get higher and higher, and the government cannot keep pace with that. I mean, that's, that's what's happening. So that's and these things of trust and, 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 and distrust, and also expectations, and, and the rising expectations. That is also this, 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 this thesis that revolutions do not um, start if the situation is hopeless, they start with rising expectations. It's not going fast enough. It's not going the way people would like to see it, or people do not feel that it's going to be of benefit for them. So this is approximately 
the way I could, let's say, theorize about this, this uh, seemingly uh, paradoxical situation. Another question from the audience. Not so, yeah? Which would start with one? Well, one is um, uh, could you talk a little bit more on uh, because the thing with uh, these talks is uh, numbers and uh, yeah. you, it sounds very rational, factual. Uh, whereas in fact you also you know make some uh, statements uh, while doing it. Um, one thing I have issue with is the term uh, Western and non-Western polytone. Could you talk a little bit more about how that came about? Because yes. what does Western entail? Because yes. obviously it's not a geographical position, but is it a cultural position? And what does it also mask or unmask? Yeah. Yes, a very interesting point, and it's always uh, uh, raised this issue. Um, let's say the, the, the difference between autochtone and autochtone is words which is only uh, a couple of concepts which used in the Netherlands never anywhere else. Um, it's a certain kind of, of kitchen Greek, autochtone, uh, autochtone, was uh, introduced by the uh, Scientific Council for Government Policy, I think at the end of the 70s or 80s, because they, 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 they say the words like gastarbeider, uh, guest laborer, or ethnic minorities, they felt they were contaminated, they were not, you could not use them anymore. They were discriminating and they were stigmatizing. So they tried to find new words which were both the position of the Dutch, let's say the original Dutch population and the non-Dutch population in a balance, autochtone, autochtone. Um, in fact, of course these words have, have, have become stigmatized as well and have become also discriminatory. So this 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 different this concept, pair of concept was just an, an artificial thing introduced. Uh, with the best, uh, uh, the best possible uh, intentions by the Scientific Council for Government Policy. The, the other thing is about Western, non-Western, and, uh, and, and ethnic minorities and so on, is it's a statistical definition, in fact, in the Netherlands, and it's pragmatic statistics which we are using. What is the idea? That if you, you are considered to be autochtone, if one of the parents was born in another country than the Netherlands, that's the mind, you could say that's the, the minimal definition. Yourself or one of your parents born in the in outside the Netherlands. And then they make the differentiation between Western and non-Western. And that's also very pragmatic. Um, if you were born in Japan, you are considered Western. If you were born in Vietnam, you are considered non-Western. If you are from Suriname, you are from the non-Western. If you are born in Indonesia, you are considered Western. And what is the whole issue about it? Um, is there a policy towards these people? Is there a problem with them? Uh, do they rely on social security, things like that? Japanese in the Netherlands do not rely on social security. These are people coming temporarily in the Netherlands because the fact that their firm sends them here and they live in Amsterdam, do the shopping in Japanese. Uh, Shops, etc., and go back most of the time. People from the US are not considered to be a problem in that sense. The non Western definition is also this is a pragmatic policy definition, uh, uh, organized, we say, by, by the, 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 the statistical and uh, statistics, in that sense, etc., over the statistic. Um, you could say for policy reasons. That's the whole idea behind it. So there is a pragmatic definition. So that's why I say, well, in my opinion, about pragmatic definition, there is no reason anymore to consider people from Suriname as non-Western. You could easily make another definition of that sense. And you must realize that this is a typical Dutch uh, solution, uh, which is not followed by other countries. In France, it's even forbidden by law to make this kind of definitions and this kind of, uh, you could say, uh, divisions of the population, because everybody belongs to the French Republic, is part of the French Republic, eats French, speaks French, etc. And you should not make this kind of, of, of differentiations. And we are going very, very far in this sense. Of course, the other thing is that you, you stop to be non-Western uh, of, of autochtone um, after, in 
many cases after two generations. For instance, the Moluccans in the Netherlands are in that situation now. The Moluccan group in the Netherlands came in 1950, 1951, in one, uh, two boats to the Netherlands. Um, there was no uh, involvement with the Moluccans anymore, so there was not a, a, a afterwards with my follow migration, with migration. Now they are in the third generation, and as the Moluccans are very uh, much to the stick to their own group, you will find many Moluccan people who have parents who were both born already in the Netherlands. And the result is we do not know anymore now how much more the Moluccans live in the Netherlands because we cannot see them statistically anymore. Because even if they are very, very Moluccan, um, Moluccs, whatever you would like to say, uh, in the third generation, they, most parents were born in the Netherlands and they are statistically unnoticeable anymore. Is that an answer to your question? No, we are not satisfied. Another one. Yeah. Well, you, see, you uh, talk about it as being a, permit, a pragmatic choice. Yeah. That's very Dutch as well, because yeah. I don't think it's a pragmatic choice, it's a political choice as well. Yeah, but that's and, and it has to do a lot with economics um, oh. as well. I think, and, and uh, like myself, I'm physically not uh, read as uh, uh, Lester, Lester's of what I am. Um, but what I, how can you see Indonesia as a, as a, as a Western? Uh, uh, I, I don't get that, because does that have to do with, with economics, or does that have to do, I mean, it's also the biggest Muslim nation in the world. Yeah. It's very good. It has to do with microeconomics. It has to do with the fact that the people, from the, the Dutch people, the people in the Netherlands who are born in Indonesia, if, 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 if they leave out the Moroccan group, are uh, people coming from migrants from Indonesia, does a Dutch ancestors or even completely Dutch than having lived and been born in, the, in, in Indonesia. Um, and the reason that they were not included in this definition anymore is that there is no so say, policy towards them. Uh, they are considered to be completely integrated into Dutch society, maybe physically a little bit visible, but otherwise completely integrated. And there was no need, let's say, policy need or whatever need anymore to, to, to do this. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's not in a macroeconomic sense of the word, but in a macroeconomic sense of the word, you have more right. That's absolutely, it is very pragmatic. And this is really, and this was not a joke, I said, but pragmatism and policy is very much uh, able to reach each other in this sense. Another question from the audience. Yes. You mentioned that after the murder of um, Theo van Gogh, the, uh, the unrest was mainly in the smaller places. That uh, makes me to ask uh, whether the uh, uh, unrest comes mainly through the media mm. or from uh, diary experience. Because sometimes people tell me, ah, you, you don't know, you are living in a nice neighborhood, but I know these rest most, I guess, uh, these things are, have, have to do with uh, If you look at what happened after the day of the Gogh there was the idea of that uh, the day after that, so two days after that, I, was, uh, I had an interview on, on the West Deutsche Rundfunk, and the first thing the, the interviewer said to me was, Ja, Herr Schnabel, what about Brent? I said, Well, there were some fires at some places, and of course, and if you look at who put these, uh, who made these fires, most youngsters, and sometimes there were youngsters in, in, in conflict with each other, as uh, happening groups of, of, of let's say, auto um, uh, youngsters, Moroccan boys, as fighting with, uh, with, with the, the out of tone youngsters and things like that. There was not really a riot, to, let's say, on a big scale, uh, with, generated by, 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 by big groups of them. It was just were small incidents. The media, of course, have their own issue, have their own, own stake in this, and also have their own influence in this. Media make a picture, of course, of how dangerous certain areas are, or how certain situations are, or how uh, maybe sometimes difficult to believe that the majority of people from Morocco or Turkey are just, let's say, law abiding citizens trying to find a job for themselves and trying to help the children uh, in, 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 uh, 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 go to school. That's what media does, that's of course. 
But there is not only media, it has also to do with adolescents making uh, fights with each other. Um, yeah, well, it's, 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 it, you really should have, you should have focus on the specific situations. Was there a specific thing at, at, at stake? Um, on the other hand, it's quite clear, of course, just like we see that with the, the obnoxious uh, thing, especially in Morocco news, the things they voice, the things they pronounce against women, against homosexuals, etc. Of course, things they have heard at home, they do not make that up themselves. These are things which are part of the discussion culture of men in those societies, uh, of what they hear at home, what they hear from uncles and nephews and brothers and sisters and so on. So in that sense, it's, of course, it's, it's not only that you could say, well, it's only the media, or it's only, uh, uh, let's say, uh, communicated through, through this kind of, of, of images and pictures. Yeah, there is no balance at this moment, I think. Um, one of the things we, shall, we, tend, we tend to forget all the time, and that's what I try to, uh, to tell you, about, is in fact we look at a short period of time in which a lot of things have happened. Big numbers of people coming to the Netherlands. A uh, very strong follow migration. Um, you see that the second generation is mainly in the adolescent generation, between 15 and 25 years old. If you have big groups, especially of males in that, this age group, you will have problems. You will have a high number of criminality, you will have a high number of you say, social tension and sometimes even of violence. That's, uh, especially while they live so concentrated in specific areas and specific cities. Uh, in so, I mean, it's not a natural thing, but it's, it makes it more understandable why it's now, at this moment, in these last years, is so prominent and so uh, sometimes also so uh, so worrying for everybody, also for for city councils, etc. But really, people are uh, are very worried about what could happen or what is happening in some areas. Yeah. 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 I'm a, I uh, first have to admit that I get very nervous when I get confronted with ciphers. And it uh, uh, makes it probably quite difficult to, to formulate this question to me, but um, something that interests me is um, a position of a public intellectual or even an artist as a public intellectual within this whole story. Um, my question would be probably such statistics were not that way, you, you, you will correct me if they were, but if any part of a public intellectual discourse about this issue, which is immense. We all feel qualified yeah. to talk about these yeah. issues, about fear, anxiety, immigration, terrorism, etc. There's immense discourse going on. My question would be, does this have any impact on the popular opinion or feeling about the issues? Even, even that kind of popular intellectual discourse, yeah. when you think of multicultural drama or recent book by Paul Schaeffer, does it in any way influence this or is this a kind of game we have amongst ourselves and some of us manage to have some voice towards probably government as, as for, for example uh, a figure that you represent, but is this something that would be interesting to consider? Is there a different uh, sentiment in the country after essay multicultural drama is being issued? Or am I being very naive? No, you don't think it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, one year or two years before the multicultural drama, I gave a lecture to, uh, for, for uh, the, 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 the multicultural group of people, uh, the, the Forum, the Institute for Multicultural uh, Cooperation. In those days, still uh, presided by Ahmed Amtan, the President uh, Secretary of State. And he asked me to do this, to, uh, to give my view on the multicultural society. And and those NSA in 1999, uh, it's not going well with the integration in the Netherlands. And I had figures, of course, to show that and we should do it differently. And we should put more emphasis on integration and even assimilation. And then everybody uh, turned against me, um, especially uh, also people from, from, from the, the, the Labour Party and so on. That was completely wrong. You could not say these things, etc. And then I asked, but is it not important that people uh, learn the language of the where they live and where they have to learn. Yes, of course, of course, people learn the language, that's what I say. It's not important that they earn their own money to support.
support their own families. Yes, of course that's important. But that's what I say. Make that possible and make it possible not on the way that you say, well, of course everybody is going to win the election. Because that's not true. The figures show that's not true. That's not the work that's not happening. Make this compulsory. Take care. People really are able to be independent and to live autonomously in a modern society. Do not say pamper them, as we would call it now, with uh, the, 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 the social security system because it does not help them in the end. It leaves them in a very dependent situation and it is a very bad example for the children. The idea you get money and as the Danish, one of the Danish ambassadors in another country once said to me, we give the people money and we ask them to stay in, in, in their own house because we don't need them, we don't have work for them, we don't like them, but yeah, we are decent people, so we give them money so that they can give it in front of them. Ask the family to stay in their own home and not Poland's. Very interesting, eh? progressive country, uh, and modern conservatism. And that was my worry. I said that this is not good, this is not going well, and we have to change it. Paul Schaeffer, one or two years later, was just that was then you see you, you saw the switch, you could say he managed to make this clear. We want to go to Obama and then we should do differently at ourselves and also. Now, interesting, if you look at his book, you see that he, and we, have, we had a discussion uh, together about that last week uh, with the Minister of, uh, with Ella Voss, with the Minister of Minister Volkmark. And I was very happy with his new book, I must say. It's not, it does not really go into the details of what's going on in the Netherlands, but it tells the history of migration, in fact. And what I was happy with is that he, in fact, came back uh, of it, uh, from his position where he was only say, seeing the drama, and not only drama, tragedy in fact, very, very bloody and everything. And he saw it now well, more, um, say, it was more optimistic uh, and more hopes for the future. Also making comparisons with other countries, with other situations, with countries with a longer history of migration, seeing that in all these countries, the United States included, Australia included, Canada included, you saw the same type of problems. With the second generation, with follow up, follow up migration, rights imported, etc. It's one group looking, uh, let's say, um, jealously at the other group. What are they doing here? Uh, we are the newcomers, they should not come here, they make it worse for us, etc. And it makes him, it has given a new, could say, vision. Now, figures, I think, are critical instances. I always consider them to be uh, the critical instances. Sometimes it's necessary to say to people, yes, you may think this is the case, but it is not the case. The case is different. So please continue your discussion uh, on everything. <coughs> please take care of what you are implying, what you are saying. If you talk about the third generation, you are talking nonsense, because there is not yet a third generation. Uh, things like that. Um, if you talk, last week someone said that to me. Oh, don't forget it, all these talented, these talented young Turks going back to Turkey. It's all nonsense. She happened to know two or three Turkish people who went back to Turkey, went back to Turkey, went to Turkey as Dutch Turks, and then suddenly found out that they do not really command the, the, the Turkish language in the way you should do in Turkey, and that they do not know how to handle these Turkish authorities. And more so, a small corruption in Turkey. What kind of things are acceptable and not acceptable? Because it's a very it's a very difficult thing to know. Uh, and then they would realize that they cannot, by themselves, you could say, live in Turkey without the support of people uh, from their own family and their own uh, uh, group uh, to help them to find their way in this country, which is a completely different country where they are considered to be not Turkish at all and to be considered to be Dutch. And that's not uh, the problem in those, days, in those uh, situations. I find figures very important to, let's say, keep. Hygiene in the discussion. Um, it's for me, it's always the critical instance. And then you can discuss all things what, what is good to do, what should you do? Should you strive for assimilation or acculturation or integration? Should it be uh, segregation uh, in the sense of uh, in, in private life, but integration in working life, and things like that? That's, of course, that's, that's ideology, that's policy oriented, and that's what people may have their own opinions about. But I always find it very important to provide data. Next week we are going to do this with our new 
yearly report on integration and, and, and the week afterwards we saw the first report on discrimination on the labour market. I find it really very important to show what numbers there are, what situations there are where people are discriminated against or um, how things in educational field where the, the idea in the Netherlands at the moment is that there is nothing that a disaster there that people do not are not successful in schools. Or on the other hand, always the story that the girls are doing so fantastically and that the boys are doing shit. That's an exaggeration of the situation. There is a difference in that. Just like with Dutch, uh, Dutch boys and girls, and Dutch girls are also better in schools than Dutch boys. Same old for Turkish and Turkish boys and girls. But now it's sometimes the discussion is well, the girls fantastic and the boys uh, forget about them. Not true. Important, I find, to make this clear. Does it always play a role in discussion? No, not always. In many cases, not. I mean, you, and I know that someone like here feels they're not interested in what we show the positive things. Uh, he will always take out what is, uh, what is in his political, uh, for his political agenda important. But the other politicians do affect the same, of course, with the things that we show. And then, just our uh, responsibility stops. Our responsibility is to provide the, as good as possible the figures, the data, the facts, and uh, also to interpret them. We do not just send out figures in the world to interpret them and to try to make, to say, to help to rationalize, to be a bring a more rationality in policy and in politi political debate. And sometimes we succeed, and sometimes it's. Oh, it doesn't work. Not always. In the interest of time, I'll take your question, which was there already as the last one. Thank you. Um, I come back to the title of your lecture, uh, The Temperature of, the, of Holland. And what I miss in, in, when I look at that uh, subject, I miss uh, the, uh, the issue of aging. Yeah. The way the aging is brought into the Dutch core and discourse is such splitting. Dutch people, the younger and the older, in such a way that it's, uh, it's a real threat, I think.
funds together are 700 billion euros, and which you do privately, uh, again, again, is another four to five hundred billion euros. So we have more than two times our national income in savings for pensions. And our and the, 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 the general pension, the state pension for 65, is not really a big issue. It's a small issue. It can be. It's, it's, it's a problem for the politics. But in fact, if you look at it, it's not really a huge problem. We have taken very good care, in fact, of our old age, much better than than practically all other countries. The the, the, the civil service pension fund in the Netherlands is the third largest pension fund in the world. Only the Japanese civil service pension fund is larger than the pension funds of the state of California is larger. Oh, but, yeah. yeah, but it's not one fund as far as maybe not that part of okay, that we are forced. That, uh, but we have uh, only also the the the, the, the Albert Berg, which has 200 billion euros uh, in stock for us. Um, sorry, maybe a little bit too hopeful, but um, <laughs> so, in, in, in that sense, it's very important to have this. Also, there are hygiene discussion. Of course, aging is in every Western society is a problem, it's a, especially where it, 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 it relates to care and needs for care for people, for elderly people, most over 75 years, not before that. Um, but I think we should be more proud of the situation we have in the Netherlands in that sense, that we have better taken care of the future than many, many other countries in Western Europe. And what people are afraid is that these countries will come to us. To get a share of our pension funds, but that is legally, practically impossible. Uh, that is not, not, not feasible that that is going to happen. So I'm not so pessimistic in that sense. If you can help us, that helps. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm much more optimistic than uh, many people are. Yeah. In the interest of time, I'd like to close the discussion. Uh, we have an opportunity to continue um, at BAC. Everyone is invited to come and talk some more.